much it. Tonight we're in 2 Kings again, and we're going to be picking it up tonight in chapter 6, verse 24. So you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. Anybody visiting for the first time that I don't know, maybe? Or maybe Sunday was your first time here and I didn't meet you. Hey, welcome back there. My name is Pastor Kevin. Hope to meet you before you leave. Thank you for being here. I call tonight um, this study um, the divine warning of God. Um, in this chapter, we see the divine warnings of the wrath of God towards those who reject his loving grace. And we also see the divine promises of his deliverance for those who wait on him. And that is a constant throughout scripture. So verses 24 through 30, we're going to see his divine judgment. Um, verses 31 through 33, we're going to see persecution of God's people. And then in chapter 7, we're going to see kind of the divine promise. And then in chapter 8, 1 through 6, we're going to see some divine deliverance. I believe that we see these things and all of these things, I think, are constant throughout the scripture as we know that the Old Testament is written as an example to us. And so we are to never neglect the Old Testament, even though we give preference to the new um, but we see the Old Testament pointing towards the New, and in the New Testament, we see many things fulfilled. But the reality is that all of it is God's Word, and Scripture tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for us. Um, everything that God has written is, is, is wonderful for us. And so as we dive in tonight, I'll read a little bit, and I'll read verse 24 through verse 30. I'll take my time. It might be overwhelming. Because last week we saw a floating axe. Y'all remember that? And tonight we're going to see cannibalism. I better take my time. It's been a long day for many of us. Verse 24, if you're there with me, say amen. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadon, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria and indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. And then the king of Israel was passing on the wall, and a woman cried out to him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? from the threshing floor or from the wine presses. And so, Father, as we approach this text tonight, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to the things that you would have us to see and hear and understand and that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit as we know that all of the scripture you've written is good for us, Lord, and it's profitable. And I know that you can do a work in us. And so, Lord, we surrender to you pray that you would take away all of the things from from the day and from the week the the work of uh, uh, the work the school things lord god the hustle the bustle the the commuting the deadlines the meetings the schedules the doctor appointments and all of the things lord god the work needed at home around the house so many things that lord we encounter as you've called us to occupy until you come but when we gather on Wednesday nights, Lord, I pray tonight and every Wednesday night that you would allow that to all fade into the background, that you would take this remnant of the church that shows up here on Wednesday nights and that you would refresh us in a very special way. Lord, that we would be built up and strengthened and ready to face whatever is, is before us when we leave this place tonight and tomorrow and for the rest of the week until we gather again. Lord, let this place that we gather and, and, and when we open our Bibles, when we sit in this place, Lord, have your way in us work on us. We rewire, um, refocus us, Lord God, recalibrate us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, right off the bat, the first thing we see is judgment on the safety and security of the nation through military force. Um, one of the things that we see right off the bat. Now, if you remember at the end of, of uh, verse 23, as we were looking at that, if you remember last week, Elisha prayed that God would blind the, the, the bands of raiders that came out of Syria and God blinded them. Y'all remember that? Um, he first prayed, God opened the eyes of my servant so that he can see clearly. And when he opened his eyes, he saw that the mountain was filled with an angelic hosts of chariots of fire 
uh, and, and Elisha had said to his servant, there are more that are for us than there are those that are against us. And so then he, he prayed that God would blind the Syrian uh, invaders, their, um, the bands of raiders blind them. And so then he, he said to them, hey, you're in the wrong place. The guy, and this is not where the guy you're seeking is. And so he led them. He said, let me show you. And he led them into Samaria. And when they got there inside the city, the fortified city, they realized, he, he said, pray the Lord, open their eyes. And they realized, oh my Lord, we're in, we're in Samaria. And if you remember that, um, the king was, said, my father, talking to Elijah, shall we kill them? And he says, no. Would you kill those who you take captive in war? Y'all remember this? So he said, feed them and send them home. So he fed them and he sent them home. And at the end of verse 23, remember it says, so the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. But then right in verse 24, the king of Syria is invading Israel. So obviously there's been a little bit of time passed since the events of the, pre, the, the first part of the chapter took place, but also there seems to be a little bit of a difference in the heart and the mind of these bands of raiders who realize that there's a God in Israel and we need to lead them alone to the king of Syria and his, uh, if you will, desire still to capture and control Israel as a territory even after Elisha had healed his servant Naaman. Y'all remember that? A while back from leprosy, but still the king of Syria wants to capture Israel, wants to control Israel, wants to persecute Israel. And one of the reasons why is because um, it, it seems as though the whole world hates Israel because God loves Israel. That's always the case. And so we see this. So right in verse 24, it happened that after this, that Ben Haddon, the king of Syria, gathered all his army and went and he besieged Samaria. Now Samaria, if those of you remember, is the capital of Israel, the northern tribes of Israel. Jerusalem is still the capital of, of Judah in the south, but Samaria is the capital city of Israel, the northern 10 tribes. And so the, this invasion is taking place in the north. Syria is coming down from the north and invading Israel, coming right into the land of Israel with this entire army and surrounding the city of Samaria. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that the king of Israel retreated into the city and didn't even want to fight because he felt that his army was no match for the Syrian army. And so everyone retreated into the city um, because the one thing that Samaria had was fortified walls. Fortified walls of a city was the best defense in ancient times for any type of invasion, which is what's happening here. And so they, they retreat inside the city. However, there's an obvious offense against this tactic, which is going to happen here as what we're going to see is that the Syrians will just say, well, then we'll just surround and besiege them. And so we cut off their supply chain and now we can just chill out and wait. That's what the Syrians are thinking. So unless your city has, you know, everything it needs within it, natural water, um, fields and, and all that kind of stuff, which obviously it wouldn't have, um, there's going to be a time limit on how long you can actually hold up within a city. And so that's what we're beginning to see. So now this invasion has come in and they've cut off through military force, the nation's safety and their security. The interesting thing about this is that things have kind of shifted in some ways back to ancient times, not to get ahead of this too much. And that the way that you can, if you will, besiege a nation today is the same thing. Um, in a sense, you begin to take away their, um, their supply chain, if you will. It's very interesting if you think about modern warfare. Um, the one thing about the United States of America is that because of our military force, nobody wants to go to war with us. Nobody in the world wants the United States Navy to pull up on their coast. They don't want that. Um, ever since we dropped two bombs on Japan, nobody wants to fool with the United States military. Um, but you can, you can still besiege a nation by over time wearing them down from a moral perspective and getting them off focus and imbalanced um, and, and to some degree, the United States of America has become kind of a, the laughter, the laughter of, of many nations because we're too confused trying to figure out how to define what a woman is um, to be able to really be focused on the things that are important. And so we, we, we have no control over borders. We have no control over morality. 
Uh, we're weakened as a nation because of it, and we're vulnerable. And so, anyway, I want to stay on task. So, first of all, they take away the, the safety and security. Well, we are safe and secure with inside the walls, if you will, the, 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 the imaginary walls of the United States of America because of our military. But I think that the concern is that maybe we are a little too secure in our own minds because when you, as we're going to find, this divine judgment comes as you turn from God. The, the next thing we see here is a judgment on their economy. Let's look at it again in verse 25. There was a great famine now in Samaria. And indeed they besieged it, notice, until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. Now I should have done this math in my notes, but I'm gonna pull out my calculator. All right. So scholars would say that five shekels of, of silver would be equal to, I forget what it was, um, about five months worth of, of wage, if that makes sense. I did the math earlier, so I'm just gonna skip and give it to you. So I calculated um, that if five shekels equal about five months wage, and this is 80 shekels, and I did the math that if you take a day's wage, and I can go work at McDonald's for $15 an hour now, which is crazy, so I would say, okay, well, let's take a day's wage of about $25 an hour per day. Um, if you've ever done payroll, you know that there are 2,080 hours in a year So I did for, of, of payroll. So I did all the math today and came up with $347,000 is what this donkey's head is worth in our economy. Everybody with me? $347,000 for this donkey's head. This is what besieging this city has done to them economically. Well, why? Well, because the supply chain is cut off. See, the Syrians are sitting outside the walls of, of Israel, of Samaria, and they've just set up camp. They've built little huts. They got their little administrative hut. They got their little, you know, supply hut set up. They've got caravans of supplies going to Syria and coming back and forth. Their soldiers are sitting out playing poker, you know, and hanging out, you know, and, and, and you know, shooting dice and, and, and horseshoes. They're relaxed. They don't have anything to worry about because they know that inside Samaria is a limited supply of stuff. And eventually they're going to run out. It's like a, it's, it's just the military tactic. So all they got to do is wait it out at this point. And inside the walls, they are depleting all of their resources. They retreated inside a fortified city, yes. But they're going to run out of things. And so now it's come to the point that it says in verse 25 that a donkey's head... And the, the crazy thing about a donkey's head is I could probably, if you give me a donkey's head and you give me some onions and some garlic and some peppers and maybe some black eyed peas and string beans, I could probably make that donkey's head taste like something and those peas would be good for a few days. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to wear out. So basically for three hundred forty something thousand dollars I could feed a family for three or four days, one family. That's the reality of where they are in their economics. It's a very interesting tactic when you begin to think about it. And it's a very interesting tactic when we begin to think about the times we live in. We've heard hints of supply chain issues. And you know, the reality is China, Russia would love to cut off our supply chain, but they are afraid of our military. That's what we have going for us in the United States of America. Very interesting, not to make it about us, but, the, but just to put it in perspective, this is the reality is what was taking place in Israel. But the same thing can take place today in modern times if you really think about it. So they've cut off their supply chain. Their economy has just tanked. Okay, so now in Israel, their morality was already gone because Jezebel and Ahab and all their kings have been leading them into idolatry, which we know and we've looked at. So now their security is gone. Now their economy is ruined. And the next thing to go is judgment on, the, on their very nature of their humanity. Look at it with me, verse 26 through 30. It says, then the king of Israel was passing by on the wall and a woman cried out to him saying, help my Lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord doesn't help you, where can I find help for you? Here's a king who now has no ability to do anything for his people at all. And that's a hard place to be as a king because a good king wants to be able to help his people. He says, from the threshing floor, 
meaning there's no agriculture. I have nothing, no wheat. There's no grain I can offer you. From the wine press, there's no agriculture. The, 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 the vineyards are outside the city. We're running out of that. I can't give you bread or wine. I can do nothing for you. God himself would have to help you. So then the king in verse 28 says to the, to the woman, he says, well, what is troubling you? And listen to what she says. And she answered, this woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Sackcloth is a mourner's garment and it's kind of rough, if you will. And so it scratches the skin, it's, it, the skin is constantly irritating. And this is what he has on his undergarment because at this point he's in complete mourning for the people. Did you catch the scene? They are starving inside Samaria because the king of Israel in his fear went in and locked the city down, afraid to fight and afraid to go to the man of God who's been giving good counsel towards him against the Syrians. Y'all remember in the early in the chapter where Elijah would send say, hey, you watch out over here because the, the Syrian raiders are coming and don't go over there because the Syrian raiders are coming. They were so upset because Elisha was telling the king their secrets and the king didn't think to go and inquire. No, he's still in idolatry. And so now they're in the situation where women within his city are eating their babies. Ladies, can you imagine that? See, one of the things that happens when you, when, when, when it gets so bad, once, you, once you've taken away morality and once the economy tanks and, and, and security is gone and it gets so bad, people will do things that they never thought they would do. You know, they're like, I saw glimmers of it during COVID when people would, you know, jump in front of little old ladies to grab the last thing on the shelf at the grocery store. It's, like, it's funny. You know, we, we can read this and say, man, this is crazy. But the reality is this is human nature when they're separated from God in idolatry and everything begins to, to dive. And these ladies had made an agreement to eat their own children. And you might say, well, how can it, how can it get that bad? How could God allow it to get that bad? How could, why wouldn't God step in? Well, what we got to remember is God only allowed what they wanted for themselves. In fact, if you would turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28, really quick, just turn with me over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I want to share with you God's word concerning this scene that we're looking at right now. It's to the left if you're new to the Bible. It's, it's within what we call the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy and chapter 28 is where we want to go. Before we get to this place in, in, in 2 Kings where we are, there's so many things that lead to that. There's so many things that the people had to do in order to get themselves in that predicament, which God in his loving, merciful, gracious nature, his long-suffering nature, had told them and warned them of long before. And so in verse 45 is where we pick it up. Y'all okay? In verse 45 of, of Deuteronomy 28, God said, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed. Notice, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. Which, by the way, his commandments and his statutes were put in place to protect them, to keep a loving environment around them all the time. Because if you look at all of the things that he warned them of, he was simply saying, hey, I'm the Lord, your God, who, who has taken care of you and brought you out of the land of Egypt. Have no other gods before me. I'm the one that takes care of you. If you love me and stay with me, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make these promises. I'm going to protect you. Nothing's going to come upon you. And, and all and on and on and on. And then in verse 46, it says, and they shall be upon you for a, notice this, a sign and wonder and on your descendants forever. So he's saying, hey, when you drift away from me because you turn from me and you go into idolatry and you begin to do wickedly, when these things take place, they will be a sign to you that you've gone too far and you're under now my judgment. 
and you need to turn back. Verse 47, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart, for the abundance of everything, he's even remembered, the, he had given them everything they needed, a land of milk and honey, y'all remember. Therefore, verse 48, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness um, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. In other words, you were free and you had everything abundance, but because you chose to reject that and go after all these other things, this will come upon you. Verse 49, and the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as a swift, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you do not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favor to the young. Let's keep and continue. And they, notice this, and they shall eat the increase of your livestock. In other words, they're going to eat up all your produce and the produce of your land until you are destroyed they shall not leave you grain or new wine of or oil or increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks they shall besiege you verse 52 which is where we are in second kings y'all with me they shall besiege you they shall surround your city they shall besiege you on all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust Remember, this is what the king of Israel did. He trusted in the fortified walls of Samaria, in which you trust, come down throughout your land, and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all the land which the Lord your God has given you. Notice verse 53. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your son's own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord God has given you in the siege. He even prophesied of it in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemies shall distress you. Verse 54, here it is. The sensitive and very refined men among you will be hostile towards his brother, towards the wife of his bosom and towards the rest of his children whom he leaves behind so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat. It says, even the humble and, and delicate among you. Because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. God is allowing this. This is not God doing this. But he told him hundreds of years before. Verse 56, the tender and delicate women among you who would not venture to set a sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity will refuse the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter. In other words, even the, the delicate women. You know, as we go back over to our text, God is saying hundreds of years before that these things are going to come and he's warning them. And he's saying, hey, don't turn from me, but follow my command. So as we think about what they're going through, what we're understanding is that they drifted from the Lord. They went into idolatry. They rejected him with open hearts and minds. They walked away from the Lord. And this is why this has now come upon them. And one of the things that I see as I look at all of this, um, as I call this, remember the divine warning of God is that it's very interesting. God said it, these things would be signs for you when these things happen that you've gone, you've gone too far. In other words, there's kind of warnings in the prophets that hey, there's a time coming when things will go too far and God's judgment will have to come upon it. And the interesting thing about that is God has done that throughout time. In fact, this thing that we're looking at in 2 Kings chapter 6 has happened to them at least three times. It happened here with the Syrians. But then according to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, it was coming they didn't listen until Babylon showed up. And it happened again when they besieged Babylon. We went through Ezekiel, so y'all know what I'm talking about. But then it happened again as Daniel prophesied and as Jesus warned them in AD 70 when the Romans showed up and surrounded the city again, Jerusalem, and besieged them. And they said that the same thing took place within the city again. And then they went into captivity. And God said, hey, we won't even have a nation until we get to the last days. 
at the last days, I will cause just like the dry bones, my nation to come back and we would be in the last days. And this is where we are now. Now, the interesting thing, listen to me very carefully. The interesting thing is that when we get to these places, it's very interesting as we go through all of this, that people reject the word of God, as we're going to see as we go further into this. And, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but people reject the warning of the word of God as we get closer to judgment in every, if you will, season of humanity. We live in a time now where Israel is back in the land. So we know we're in the last days and judgment is coming upon the land according to all the prophets. And right now, one of the reasons we know we're in the last days is because people are mocking the very things that the prophets have been telling us. Um, they're, they're mocking the coming judgment. They're also mocking the rapture of the church. Um, and I wanna share that with you in a moment, but first turn over with me to 2 Peter chapter three. 2 Peter chapter three, it's Bible study, so we gotta flip our swords around a little bit, okay? Y'all doing all right? We're gonna get real good at wielding our swords. Second Peter all the way to the right, one of the last epistles, not the last, but one of the last, after Hebrews, after James. Second, there we go. Second Peter three. Second Peter three, one through 13. I'm gonna read it for you, y'all ready? He says, beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Peter says, I just wanna, I wanna stir you up. I wanna remind you of some things. This is nothing new here. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, what does he say? That scoffers will come when? Scoffers, mockers walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water. I always love that verse. That verse can make an hour's worth of scientific teaching. It speaks of how creation was in the beginning, how creation then slightly different than it is now in the sense that it seems as though there was a water canopy described for us in, in Genesis where the whole world had a climate that is quite different than what it is now. In Genesis 11, we see that there was a continental drift. But before that, in Genesis 6 and 7, there was a flood. But before the flood, we had a tropical environment around the whole world. So science says that there was an ice age, but the reality is that it wasn't an ice age. It just iced over instantly after the flood, the whole climate changed. And when that ice came upon the earth, guess what it did? It encapsulated tropical plants and animals that they have found in Antarctica and places where they've, they've dug and found these things because at one point it was a tropical planet. He says, standing in water and out of water. And then he says, he says, by which the world that then existed perished, the old world being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, because it's very different than it was then, preserved by the same word, because we know that Hebrew says that all things are being held together by the word of his power, meaning Christ, that Christ is holding everything together. If Christ were to let go, it would all be nothing, but he's holding it together and reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. So he's holding it together until he finishes his work of gathering a harvest, which is the church. He has to judge Israel at the end in the tribulation. And then he lets go and he creates a new heaven, new earth. We know he's going to have um, his thousand year reign first, but look at verse eight, but beloved, do not forget this, that one day with the Lord, excuse me, beloved, do not forget this one, this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. I love that. And I don't want to spend time on my, on, on that beautiful pattern that he set in motion in Genesis. Six days he labored on the seventh day he rested and he put that pattern throughout all creation. He showed it with Israel and how they should conduct themselves. Um, it, and what Peter says here gives us a little bit of illusion. We could have fun with it. We could say, well, maybe he did the same thing with, if you will, the history of humanity, his plan for humanity. 
six days, or if a day is a thousand years in a sense, 6,000 years of labor, and then a final day of rest. That would be very interesting. First two days, creation, fall of man. Man falls into sin, messes the whole thing up. So at the end of the first two days, he, he begins the promise that he promised back in the garden and, and when he said that the seed of the woman. So then two days in, he says to Abram, in your seed, all the earth will be blessed. So then he takes Abram and begins to create a nation. All right, so two days later, that gets fulfilled 2,000 years later as Jesus shows up on the scene, dies for sin, okay, resurrects, proving that he was God and he was without sin. Ain't that amazing? And then here we are almost at the end of the next two days coming up on 6,000 years of the labor of the earth. Very interesting. But there's a, there's a final day according to scriptures. Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand literal years upon the earth. And the description of that rule is rest. No sin, no foolishness. Jesus ruling from Jerusalem. Very interesting. Um, so let's continue. Y'all doing okay? Where am I at? So verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise then as some count slackness. And we got mockers and scoffers saying, man, ain't nothing gonna happen, ain't nothing changed. Some even saying that there is no such thing as a rapture, but the Lord is not slack, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should, be, should come to repentance. That's his desire, that's his heart. That's why he's long suffering. We want the Lord to come back now, but he's trying to save some people. So let him, let him have his time, right? Let him do what he's gotta do. I'm thankful he waited for me. <laughs> Verse 10, but he goes on to say, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In other words, since this is coming, we might want to live right is what he just said. And he says in verse 12, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, which righteousness dwells. So here's the thing, scoffers and mockers will come, which tells us we're in the last days. They are right now mocking the, the preaching of the judgment and the wrath of God coming upon this earth. There are those that, that do that. And even within what we consider the church, there are mockers of the fact that the Lord has promised to gather. I won't even say the word rapture anymore tonight. That the Lord has promised to gather his bride in the air before he begins to pour his wrath out upon this world before the tribulation period. Let me give you a couple of quotes here to help us out tonight. The first quote is from St. Ephraim. He's one of the most famous writers um, in what they call Syriatic Christianity. Um, uh, he, in fact, Ephraim, some call him, one of the most prominent of the fathers of the, the Syrian church in the fourth century, that's 300 and something y'all, um, and a great orator. He lived from 306 to 373, and here's what he said in one of his quotes. He says, we ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is imminent and overhanging. Already there have been hunger and plagues, violent movements of nations and signs, which have been predicted by the Lord. They have already been fulfilled and there is no other that remains except the advent of the wicked one in the completion of the Roman kingdom. The wicked one would be Antichrist. All saints and the elect of the Lord are gathered together before the tribulation, which is about to come, and are taken to the Lord in order that they may not be seen at the time of the confusion, the tribulation, which overwhelms the world because of our sins. He wrote that after studying the scriptures back in 300 and something. Because there, there are scoffers and mockers that try to say that the teaching of the rapture is a very new teaching. Well, maybe the teaching of the rapture is, in the sense of the word, but the teaching of the gathering together of the saints in the air with the Lord to ride off into heaven before the tribulation is what it seems that Paul believed and Peter believed and what the early church believed. Um, Arrhenius lived from 125 to 202. He wrote this, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up for this, it is said, 
there shall be tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning. Now he's quoting scripture, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous in which when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. Again, they're quoting and they're looking for this thing to take place where the Lord catches his church up. That's what they were looking for. Um, Tertullian from 155 to 225, he just kind of said this one quote I pulled out and there was a bunch of them. I just pulled three. He says, as yet those whom the coming of the Lord is to find on earth have not been caught up into the air to meet him at his coming. He says, this thing hasn't taken place yet, but this is what we're waiting for. And in all of them, you hear eminence, eminence, eminence. They're not waiting for anything to take place anymore. Nothing has to happen for the church to get caught up with the Lord. Why are they talking about that? Well, because Paul says, comfort yourself with these things. You can't comfort yourself with, we're going through the tribulation because, and then the rapture happens at the end. You, why, you know why you can't comfort yourself with that? Because you're not guaranteed to make it through the tribulation. However, if you're saved and alive when this takes place, you are guaranteed to be caught up in the air with the Lord. And the scripture implies before the tribulation because that's what we're to look for, amen? There is a judgment coming and there are markers of that biblical truth. There is a catching away. I won't even have to say the word that people don't like anymore. There is a great gathering, a catching away of the body of believers to meet the Lord in the air because according to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, we are to look for that, for the Lord himself to come and deliver us from the wrath that is to come. And the word deliver means rescue. Paul says, hey, look to be rescued because he's coming. Because then he writes two chapters later because he hasn't appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So there is a judgment against this world coming. There's also a blessed hope of the church that we should see the Lord face to face. It's a beautiful thing. Let's go back over. Now, back in our text, now we're going to see the persecution of God's people. We're going to pick it up in verse um, 31. Back over in 2 Kings chapter 6, we're picking up verse 31. Y'all there? Now, here's what it says. Then he said, God do so to me and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shephat, remains on him today. In other words, wait a minute. The Syrian king done besieged your city. Elisha, the only dude that's been helping you out the whole time, now you want to kill him because you upset. Y'all catch that? Whoa, wait a minute. You mean to tell me you're going to blame, you're going to blame the, the believers now when it has nothing to do with Elijah? You know, that, that, there's that twisted, demonic sense of anger that comes in those who, who, are, who we warn that when it all happens, they rather blame the ones who are representing God and warning them of that which is to come. And you've kind of seen that throughout history. As, remember, Pharaoh finally, finally, as he was warned by Moses over and over and over, his anger was kindled against them and he wanted to destroy them. Y'all remember that? It's kind of this thing that takes place. And I believe this is why Jesus and even the prophets warn that there will be dangerous times and persecution will come. And I, re I remember I, back during COVID, there was this sense of zealousness that was happening on all the pastors. You know, we're, you know, we're trying to tell the church, hey, we need to be ready and we need to be walking with the Lord and we need to be sold out for him to the point that we won't be moved no matter whatever takes place. He wants to destroy Elisha. So verse 32, but Elisha was sitting in his house. I can't add to the scriptures, but in the white space, I see minding his own business. <laughs> Doesn't say that. He's sitting in the house and the elders were sitting with him and the king sent a man ahead of him. And before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, do you, do, he said, do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Now, remember, I told you before, Elisha lives in such a way that he expects the Lord to show him the things that are, taken, that, are, that are taking place around him in the course of him serving the Lord and doing his ministry. And God has revealed to him that, hey, the king is sending somebody to take your head off. And this is the warning that he now has. And so, and he says, look, when the messenger comes in, he says to the elders, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Um, is it not? the sound of his master's feet behind him. Hold him a moment so I have time to speak to the king is what he's saying um, because he knows this is coming. God has revealed it to him um, because that's the way it is. You know, throughout the scriptures, 
The Bible talks about, um, Paul would often say, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning these things. Remember that? I don't want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual things, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Jesus sat down on the Mount of Olives and explained things to his disciples because God's heart for us is that we're not ignorant of truth concerning the times we currently live in and where things are headed. And Elijah gets the same sense. So they're coming to kill him now. And while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him and then the king said, now, before I get into what the king says, we need to understand, uh, Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I don't have it on the screen, so sorry, um, verse 11 and 12, he says, persecutions and afflictions will happen, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. I love this. Yes, he says, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions, but evil men and apostles will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And this is something that, that happens is the enemy, um, the enemy comes against the people of God with fury whenever he can. In fact, Revelation 12, 13 says, and when the dragon saw that, his, that, uh, saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He always turns to persecuting God's people. That's what the enemy does. And so the fury now is turned towards Elisha because he represents God. Now, I want, I want you to see uh, as we get into this, the divine promise, look at the end of verse 33. Surely, this is what the king says. Surely this calamity is from the Lord. Wait a minute. He knows this God? Then look what he says. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? You know what that tells us? That tells us that Elisha had already been speaking to the king. Listen, we need to wait on the Lord. The Lord will deliver but the king is refusing the message. Y'all see that? Don't want to hear what the people of God are saying would rather persecute them. That's what the world will do in times when God's judgment is coming upon it. Now, here's the promise. Elijah says, and we go into verse seven, but I, I won't be able to do all of it tonight. So Elijah said, hear the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. So Elisha, God reveals to Elisha that he's coming to kill him. Elisha has the elders hold the messenger long enough because the king was right behind him. He needed to get a word to the king. And here's the word. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a say of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel. Just one shekel now. And two sides of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer who was uh, who was, uh, whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, Elisha now, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat it. Now, God is going to miraculously deliver him. We got a little time. Y'all in a rush? Okay, let's at least see how this plays out and then we'll, we'll do the last point next week. All right, so Elisha says, look, by tomorrow, this economic devastation is all over with. The security, the safety and security of the nation will be restored. The economy will be restored and, and, and all of this calamity will begin to go away by this time tomorrow. And the guy who serves the king says that the Lord would open a window in heaven. This couldn't happen. So Elisha says, well, you will see it. But because you said that, you will see it, but you will not take, partake of it at all. And look, I mean, this is a miracle promise. In one day and 24 hours, the whole thing is going to change. Can such a thing be? Let's read what happens. Now there were four lepers, leprous men at the entrance of the gate and they said to one another well why are we sitting here until we die <laughs> like this <laughs> if we say we will enter the city the famine is in the city and we shall die there and if we sit here we die also that's good reasoning you know well why are we just gonna sit here and die you know we might as well like, forget forget the rule of the leper you got to stay 150 feet away and cry unclean unclean man forget all of this so he says, now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. 
And if they kill us, well, the only thing that can happen is we're going to die, which we're going to die anyway is what they're saying. Um, because a lot of times um, in Israel, if you were a leper, you were considered unclean. But for the Syrians, not necessarily so. Remember Haman, who was a, a, a le- Naaman, who was a leper, but he still had his job as, as the, the commander of the king's army of Syria. Y'all remember that? So they saw it a little bit differently. So they say, look, maybe they'll take us as prisoners of war and they'll feed us and keep us alive. And if they kill us, big deal, because we're on our way to death. Okay, that's what they're figuring. And so they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrians camp, to their surprise, no one was there. Why? Verse six, supernatural interference of the God. Here's what we see. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of great of a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled. Now, they had been besieging this place for months. So they had great supplies. OK, and they just left it and took off. Now, you might say, man, this is a little too far fetched. It's not, though. I want you all go do the study of the history of the Six Day War in Israel. OK, which is you know, like 70 years ago, maybe at the, at the most. And there were so many supernatural occurrences that took place around that war that you wouldn't believe it. And the Jewish soldiers are telling of all of these different stories of things that were miraculous that took place as they were able to win um, that war and secure their own land. So. So it says here. Verse eight, and when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into the tents and they ate and they drank and they carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them and they came back uh, and entered again another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, we're, we're not doing right. This ain't right this day. Um, it is a day of good news and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and came to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, we went to the Syrian camp and surprisingly no one was there. Not a, hum- a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called and they told it to the king's household inside. So the king arose in the night and said to his servants, let me now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. The king of Israel has no faith in God. He's uh, so he says they know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp and hid themselves in the field, saying when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And, you know, this makes no sense. All they got to do is wait for them to eat each other or die. They don't really need to fight anything. They, why would they do this? So verse 13, and one of his servants answered and said, please let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Um, look, they may either become like all the multitude of Israel that are left in it, Or indeed, I say they may become like the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let us send them and see. In other words, look, let us at least send a group out to investigate it. Verse 14, therefore, they took two chariots with the horses and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army saying, go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan. And indeed, all the road was full of garments and weapons which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So not only did they leave their camp intact, they're, they're, sh- they're shedding stuff as they go so they can get, move faster. <laughs> you know, they were afraid. This is all supernatural. So the messenger returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So here it is, a sire of flour, fine flour was sold for a shekel and two of the barley for a shekel. Notice this, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. But the people trampled him in the gate and he died just as the man of God had said who spoke to the king. 
spoke when the king had come down. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king saying, two sides of barley for a shekel and a side of flour for, fine flour for a shekel um, shall be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Did the officer, then that officer had answered the man of God and said, now look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said to him, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat it. In other words, God caused all of it to come to pass. The people were so hungry, they trampled him when the food was available. And just as Elisha had spoken. But if Eli Elisha has the power of God to prophesy these things, all the king of Israel had to do was humble himself and go to Elijah and seek his counsel and they wouldn't have been in this predicament to begin with. Which encourages me to say to you as the people of God, and as, as, as we are even here in our country in an election year, to always be in prayer for the people who belong to God, our brothers and our sisters that are in key areas who can speak to those who might listen, um, that some might get saved and turn their hearts back to the Lord. Um, the reality is the scripture already tells us where where the world is headed and we know that and scripture is sealed. However, the whole, the whole point of our, us being here, our family business is that we speak on behalf of the Lord, we live on behalf of the Lord that more people will come to know the Lord, amen? And we finish verse 20 says, and so it happened to him for the people trampled him in the gate and he died. And so that, that's the, the last part of, um, of what I'm able to go into tonight. Um, and we'll get into it tomorrow. One of the things that reminds me of that whole scene, 24 hours it took for everything to change. It goes back to 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The same thing that, Peter, that, that uh, Paul said to Timothy, that the Lord desires no one to perish, but all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of truth. That's the family business. The whole purpose for us being here is to represent him in such a way that more people will come to know him because that's his desire. He didn't create people to go into hell and perish for all eternity. He created us to have a relationship with him uh, for all eternity, a wonderful and loving relationship. Um, however, he's given us free will. He doesn't want robots. He desires that men would turn to him and be saved. And so, as Paul said to the Corinthians, through the foolishness of the gospel that is preached, meaning that he uses us to preach his gospel, that more would be saved. So, you know, the thing that we have to do, and, and remember, preaching is all, not always giving a sermon. Sometimes it's living. Amen? It's actually both. And what we have to do is live in such a way that where we're not distracted by the things of the world and, and so persecuted by the enemy that we're not able to be affected but also to remember sometimes when we're going through trials and persecutions that the way that we walk that out the way that we live that will cause more people to come to know the Lord um, we are in a sense I like the way Paul said it to uh, Ephesians we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he foreordained and that's something so, so not only is he using us as kind of his masterpiece uh, but he foreordained all the things that we would go through. So as he is molding and shaping us as his masterpiece, we become this perfect story in his timeline of what he is doing so that our life becomes a shining light or something that leads someone to him. It's amazing if we, if we realize that God is using us and he's working in our lives in ways that we can't even imagine. Um, and I, I, I know I'm guilty of getting distracted and then he has to show me sometimes that hey there's a reason why this is happening and then he, he gives me an encounter or an opportunity and that's what he's doing hey that's it for tonight we're going to pick it up next week in uh, chapter uh, 7 and 8 no chapter 8 actually we finished 7 we're going to pick it up in chapter 8 next week and continue to work through this as we see all that God will give to us y'all doing alright? Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us tonight to gather in this place that you provided to study your, your word. I pray that you would be with us as we uh, prepare to go out of this place, Lord God. Um, be with us in our fellowship time now. Maybe even through the gifts of the spirit that you would give a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom to someone for what they're facing, uh, Lord, in, in, in the life that we're living, um, that you would give exhortation, that you would use the gifts of mercy and all of the things, Lord, as we just minister one to another. Um, just pouring into one another, Lord God, 
encouraging one another. Um, we need that. I pray for that now in this time. And Lord, as those of us who will be leaving, I pray you would protect us in our, in our vehicles, in our homes, um, that you would give wisdom uh, and understanding in the, in the workplace tomorrow, in the classroom tomorrow, Lord God, whatever we're doing, uh, Lord, that we would be able to be effective, um, be a blessing to those around us, and to be able to be salt and light representing you. We love you. We thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God, God bless you all.